It's truly surreal that Doom 2 is now 30 years old. While I can hear and read that number and know it to be real, my brain has a hard time accepting that it must be fact. Despite being nearly 40 myself, I have distinct and fond memories of playing Doom 2 for the first time that feel almost like yesterday. I remember how hard I worked at booting it up on a Mac through one of those proto boot camp pieces of software. I remember a friend lending me his Doom 95 disc. I remember settling for the SNES version of Doom 1 simply because it was all I could get at the time. To commemorate Doom 2's 30th anniversary, I've decided to do a retrospective that is quite a bit different from the previous two I've uploaded here. While it would be helpful for some people to have a recounting of Doom 2's development, or even learn some tidbits about its specific design, the game has been well and truly dissected at this point in history. Any fans of Civi 11s YouTube channel will have seen clips from interviews with its software back in 1994, and there's the famous Masters of Doom book by David Kushner that details the deteriorating conditions of id software that eventually led to Quake's creation and John Romero's departure. Anything you want to know about Doom 2's creation is online somewhere. No, for this 30th anniversary, I figured I would recount my own personal history with Doom as a series and explain why it has stuck with me for so long. Truth be told, I wanted to do some interview with the devs behind the game to get a new perspective, but some of them did not respond to inquiries. I do want to give a shout out to Adrian Carmack, however, co-founder of id Software and lead artist behind Doom, for at least letting me know he doesn't do interviews anymore. As I said to him in response, the impact of his creations has left an indelible mark on me that will stay with me until I die. Nothing I can do or say will ever be enough to thank him. So, my first exposure to Doom was through a friend in elementary school back in 1995. He had shown me a magazine with screenshots of the PC version that was happily proclaiming that the game was coming to the SNES soon. Not having a compatible PC at the time, I begged my mother to get me the SNES version as it seemed like the coolest thing in the world. I remember clutching that red cartridge in the car ride home as I eagerly opened the game well before we left the Toys R Us parking lot. There was a certain mystique to the differently colored cartridge that made Doom feel even more demonic. I can't recall if Doom on SNES captivated me beyond the red cartridge or not, but I do know the following year in 1996, that same friend would eventually introduce me to PC Doom. This time, he brought in the CD version of Doom 95 that included both the original and its sequel. Unable to play the sequel as there was no SNES port, I asked if I could borrow the game to try it at home. I guess I hadn't yet understood that Mac and Windows were different machines as when I got home, my Mac wouldn't read the disc. I explained this to my mother who then remembered seeing some piece of software that let you boot Windows on your Mac, so we made a trip to CompUSA to grab that. You would think the story then concludes with me playing Doom 2, but you'd only be partially right. While that software, which I can't quite remember the name of, did boot into Windows 95, it was obviously heavily compromised by the power of our Mac. Seeing as how this was 1996, it's not like Macintosh computers were known for being ultra-powerful gaming rigs, although they still aren't. If my memory is correct, I think our machine had a 50 megahertz CPU and maybe 250 megabytes of hard disk space. That's realistically enough to run Doom, but not through a compatibility layer of software. Anyway, I did get Doom 95 to install, and was even able to boot into whichever level I wanted, but the performance was so choppy and inconsistent that it was similar to looking at a slideshow of Doom 2. I was heartbroken that I couldn't experience this game, especially since I was so close to having it work. At this point, I begged my mother to get me a Windows PC so that I could not only play all of these games, but so that I wouldn't tie up the family computer. Since my mom had incredibly bad impulse control back then, she agreed. I can honestly spin this retrospective off into how spoiled of a child I was, but now I'm having incredibly fond memories of my Packard Bell computer from that time. It's gray chassis with protruding purple feet and slightly rounded top. I felt like some mad genius with the machine as it was so far ahead of our old Mac that I was nearly booting into Windows before our old computer had even gotten past the Apple logo. That PC is the reason I became such an avid PC gamer. It's also partially responsible for me knowing any bit of MS-DOS as I had to use that to run some games from the era. When I did eventually get that PC, I borrowed Doom 2 from my friend again, and I was finally able to experience id Software's follow-up to the father of the FPS genre. I don't know if kids have any expectations for games, but this time I was captivated from just the intro screen. That sight of the Doom Marine facing off against the Cyberdemon is so iconic and badass that every time I look at it, I hear Doom 2's theme music in my mind. 
I must have spent hours playing and replaying Entryway to find all of its secrets, even if pretty much every level of Doom 2 was accessible at any time with Doom 95. I had set my desktop wallpaper to something Doom related. I had found a Doom screensaver pack at CompUSA that I adorned my computer with. I had gone crazy when I saw Final Doom in stores, since I can now run the full Doom experience without relying on the SNES. Having my own PC felt like the possibilities for entertainment were never going to get bigger or better. All of that happened to me because of Doom 2. I also have fond memories of my time in middle school, exploring land play options at a friend's house and running through Doom 2 in co-op. It felt like such a unique experience that wasn't available on consoles. The Microsoft did introduce the capability with the Xbox shortly after my cooperative trip to hell. I also played the game with my sister through our own local network, an act that started her own love and appreciation of Doom that persists to this day. As for the game itself, I've obviously gone back and forth on my opinion of it. It's very easy to sit here in 2024 and claim that the levels contained in Doom 2 aren't particularly great. I even said as much in my recent video, The Legacy of Doom is Eternal. That bit of SEO cringe title could practically act as a retrospective for Doom 2, but I wrote it more as an analysis of why Doom was so important. It also highlighted the work Night Dive Studios, Machine Games, and id Software had done in bringing the eternal FPS classics to modern consoles. Even so, Doom 2's level design is a mixed bag of some genuinely solid levels and weirdly experimental ones. Everyone likes to give Sandy Peterson shit for how obtuse and bizarre his level designs were, but it's no secret that he was responsible for half of Doom 2's locales. 16 of the main 30 levels were crafted by him, and the two hidden levels, which are reworkings of Wolfenstein 3D maps, were also done by him. To create that many levels in such a short time frame obviously resulted in some sloppy work. Peterson at least attempted to get creative with his designs, offering some gimmick levels and even pushing the boundaries of what was capable with Doom's engine. For its first nine levels, however, Doom 2 is pretty rock solid. It obviously sucks that there is a sewer level so early in the game, or at all, but you can't deny how well placed all of its enemies are and how gradual its increase in difficulty is. Nothing is truly remarkable nowadays, especially not compared against the work of modders, but Doom 2's first episode, if you will, is good. While I hate the middle third of the game, I do have to commend id Software for trying to replicate real locations in the city levels. It's interesting to see a doomified version of Earth, and that whole recreation of real places aesthetic has devolved into what is known as Doom Q. The ambition on display was wild for 1994, the same year we got such titles as Super Metroid, Daytona USA, and Final Fantasy VI. Doom was practically from the future. It's hard to claim what the definitive Doom 2 level is, but I think most people have fond memories of Map 20, Gotcha. Seeing a cyber demon square off with a spider mastermind was a legendary moment, and the whole misdirection from opening that door is worth the otherwise short and basic level. It set the stage for a generation of modders that would mix and match Doom's roster of villains to perfection in the decades that followed. People will probably also point to a level like Map 24, The Chasm, for how bizarrely strict its gimmick is, or Map 8, Tricks and Traps, for putting players through a gauntlet of mini-challenges. I'm very fond of Map 11, Circle of Death, one of Romero's all-time classics, and the one that introduces the dastardly Argyle. There's also the iconic John Romero secret in the final level, something that Romero himself told me was his favorite Easter egg when I spoke to him at E3 2019. That's not even bringing up the expanded enemy roster that perfectly fills the gaps the original Doom had. While Doom 1 innovated in a ton of ways, its limited roster wears in by the close of the third episode and feels completely redundant in episode 4. By expanding it with one palette swap and a bunch of incredibly mean new additions, Doom 2 cultivated a roster of foes that would become the blueprint for FPS games for the next decade. With so little overlap between enemy skills and the ability to get them to fight each other, it's impossible to not find enjoyment in Doom 2's combat. Also, fuck the pain elemental. I've played and beaten Doom 2 possibly more times than any other game I've experienced in my life. At this point, it has become such a piece of comfort media for me that I could put it on at any moment and feel at ease. It's hard to remember the exact first moments well, but Doom 2 is a part of me that will never get old. Every other shooter is measured against Doom 2, and while I do have games I enjoy more, there will never be anything that gets lodged in my brain quite the same way. While modern Doom is cool and all, I think the impact and style that is classic Doom will always be my preferred vision of hell. 
Here's to 30 years of Doom 2 and finally feeling like I'm an old bastard. I can't wait to see what becomes of this classic when we get to the 50th anniversary.